We are just a little bit before uh, our next scheduled case at 11, which is Thomas Tannock, Special Administrator versus HCR Manor Care. Are both sides and all of the anticipated parties, if so, here? I think we are, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Well, come on up. We'll get started. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue this morning. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you are the appellant and wish to reserve that time and you let me know when you get started, I'm keeping the clock this morning to keep you apprised of the passage of time. The court's read the briefs and we are ready to see when you are. Judges, I apologize. I have a bottle of water. I hope the court's okay with that. It's fine. I'm still getting over a cold, so bear with me. I would like to reserve the entirety of the five minutes. Good morning, judges. May it please the court. My name is Mike Fuller. I'm here on behalf of the plaintiff in this matter and have the honor of representing the Nestor estate. Uh, Ms. Nestor was 86 years old when she went to the nursing home. It was owned and operated by the defendants in this case. She went there for rehab after falling at home and suffering a fractured hip. Rehab was progressing well. She was in the facility a total of 28 days. And then she dies. The chart of the defendants is silent for the last four days. There's no nursing notes. Related to us by her daughter, Ms. Lever, was that she was told her mother choked to death. And what the depositions we've taken so far have ferreted out is that apparently there were nursing notes that have now disappeared. But the memory of the witnesses indicate there was at least one, if not two, choking incidents that last day that she died on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, no less. Ms. Lever came to us near the expiration of the statute of limitations. There's no question about that. We filed the case within the two-year wrongful death statute of limitations to preserve the case. Shortly thereafter, I think the, the case was actually filed on the 17th of November or 18th. By the 25th, there's evidence in the record over the trial court below that we had arranged her to uh, work with Mr. Tandiff to open the estate. My limited knowledge of opening estates in Ohio is that it can be a little bit of a process. So to expedite the process, Mr. Tanev got appointed as a special administrator. We had a hearing with Judge Parker, and I say a hearing, it was more of a status conference, it wasn't on the record. And the, the agreement between the parties, we discussed some of the issues pending, is that we would allow, the court would and did, allow us to amend once Mr. Tanev got appointed as the special administrator of the estate. Defendants could raise all their issues with the capacity or standing or whatever they wanted to, everything would be preserved. And then the court would make a, a ruling on that after Mr. Tanner was appointed and substituted in. And that's what we did. Judge Parker then issues an order dismissing the case, saying that Ms. Lieber never had standing, so that it doesn't relate back and her earlier filing is moved. He also makes a point in there to include in his order that had Ms. Lever actually been appointed as the nominal party over the estate, it somehow may have made a difference in his ruling. That's not the law of this state. That's where he, I think it's our position that Judge Parker made two mistakes. One on the issue of relation back, and two, even prior to getting to that, is standing. He says, Ms. Lever, the daughter, the wrongful death beneficiary had no standing. I think that the case is going back to Keyes, to Douglas, um, uh, Ramsey, and even this court in Stone versus Phillips. She had standing as a wrongful death beneficiary. This court has also went to great extreme in uh, Country Club, <coughs> Townhouse versus North Condominium, as well as Benefit Management versus GenCorp to explain the difference between standing and capacity to sue. And I think that's where Judge Parker made the mistake. 
She had standing. Now, he may have been right. She may not have had capacity at the time she filed the complaint. But again, based on Douglas, Keyes, Ramsey, all from the Ohio Supreme Court, this court's opinion in Stone, you don't need that. Even if you look at the wrongful death statute, which some argue say you have to have an estate open before you can enter the courthouse. If you read the statute, this is um, 212502 at C, it specifically reads, and I quote, a personal representative appointed in the state with the consent of the court making the appointment and at any time before or after the commencement of a civil action for wrongful death may settle with the defendant the amount to be paid. Well, if you had to have it open before you can even enter the courthouse, subsection C makes no sense. And we have to give meaning to the statute. This court specifically finds in Stone that, and the Stone case is very similar to the situation here. Um, and if the court is familiar with that, I won't belabor it, but it was a grandmother and mother bringing a suit on behalf of her daughter who was killed and the two surviving children. She filed the suit, was not appointed, no estate was open, and she wasn't appointed guardian at that time over the kids. Within about 18 months, not the two or three months that we took, 18 months, the court allowed her to amend and said it related back. And this court again held that, yes, it relates back. She filed, she didn't have the estate open, but that's a nominal party. She, she was a real person interested as a wrongful death beneficiary. And this court specifically says, citing Bell, justice abhors the loss of a cause of action by pure technicalities. And that's what the defendants are asking for here today. Judge Hansel, I don't know if you remember, but I argued a very, very similar fact pattern just this last, I believe it was November. Um, and one of, the, one of you judges brought up the issue of Cushing's and how Cushing's would, would in, in a play. Well, they, in their brief in this case, say, you all got Cushing's wrong. They say, the majority opinion in Ramsey is wrong. They say Douglas is wrong. They say Keyes is wrong. They don't even address Stone. But I'm sure if you ask them, they'll say it was decided wrong. But that's the law in the state. It's the difference between standing to file suit and capacity having someone appointed over the estate. And I'll leave the court with this thought and reserve the rest of my time, at least my five minutes that Ramsey, the court, does the, con the concurring opinion, which is the majority opinion in that case, does a great job in explaining these wrongful death beneficiaries, they, they, they don't know what to do. They don't go and open an estate ahead of time. But they're still entitled to that full two years. And that's what Ms. Lever's entitled to. She got the case filed timely within the two years, expeditiously opened the estate. One last thing, they did after the appeal was Filed, filed a motion to dismiss the appeal. Because while Mr. Tanf was appointed a special administrator and when the appeal was taken, was still a special administrator, Ms. Lever has now been appointed as the full administrator. And if this court will grant our appeal and send us back, we'll then move to have Ms. Lever as the full administrator substituted in for Mr. Tanf. <coughs> uh, counsel, although I remember the argument, I don't remember the case name last fall. It was Reynolds. And it was actually the, the cause number is 27411. Thank you, judges. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Randy Angward. I'm here on behalf of the appellees <coughs> in this case. Um, I believe where Mr. Fuller left off is the threshold question that this court has to answer before it gets to the merits of the appeal, is whether this appeal is presently properly before the court. When Thomas Teneff filed the notice of appeal, he was, at that time, the personal representative of the estate of Anna Nestor. Thereafter, Patty, Patty Lever, the daughter of Anna Nestor, became the administrator of the estate.
estate, the personal representative who is required to bring the wrongful death cause of action. She's the proper party plaintiff. At no time since she became the personal representative of the estate has there been any motion to this court to amend the notice of appeal in order to make Patty Lever the appellant here. Thomas Teneff is no longer the personal representative of the estate. Thomas Teneff, ironically, has no standing to be here pursuing this appeal before this court. But isn't the estate actually what's here? No, Your Honor. And, uh, going to Stone and the, the majority opinion in Ramsey and, and the other cases that apply constitutional standing standards in an instance where we have a statute that confers standing to a person who is that person being the personal representative of the estate. We have to look to the statute. Who has standing to bring the wrongful death cause of action? According to the statute, and in an Ohio statutory standing, you must strictly construe the statute, clearly defines the person as the personal representative. Um, Mr. Fuller talked about 210502C. Well, if we look at A, paragraph A, the first paragraph, subsection 1, a civil action for wrongful death shall be brought in the name of the personal representative of the deceiving. The, the probate court is the proper court to change that person. Is that person going to be changed? It has been changed. Okay. And Thomas Tef Teneff is no longer the personal representative of the estate, but yet he's the one here pursuing the appeal. They should have, under Pellet Rule 3, moved to the notice of appeal to make Patty Lever the appellant because she is now the personal representative of the estate. Um, this issue, I think you need to resolve. You have a pending motion to dismiss before you, before you get to the merits of the appeal. The issues of the appeal are somewhat the same. Um, yes, we respectfully do disagree with cases where intermediate courts of appeals and even the Supreme Court of Ohio, um, the majority opinion in Ramsey, um, where they're applying constitutional standing standards to a situation where we should be applying statutory standing. You must look to the statute to, de to determine who is the proper party plaintiff. The statute defines who it is, and it indicates clearly that it shall be brought in the name of the personal representative. When Patty Lever filed the complaint in this case, the first complaint, she did not bring it in the name of the personal representative. As it's captured, and as it's pled, we don't even know who Patty Lever is. She doesn't indicate she's a beneficiary of the estate that she's the daughter of the decedent, or she did, she also doesn't state that I am the personal representative of this estate. Couldn't she even be a creditor, though, if I were to open an estate? I'm not a, <laughs> I apologize, Your Honor, I'm not a probate attorney. I don't know how probate practice works. Um, I believe that you could, as a creditor, file to open an estate to pursue your claim against the assets of the estate that are on um, but again, I think you would have to be doing it as the personal, in the name of the personal representative of the estate. You would be asking the court to appoint whoever it is that you want to be the personal representative in probate court, and they would do that, and then you come over to common pleas and file in the name of the personal representative. If you read the complaint in the caption, there's there's no indication that Patty Weaver, Patty Weaver, as she was called when the complaint was filed, was the personal representative, was coming on behalf of the personal representative or that there even was a personal representative. Um, we didn't know who the personal representative or if there even was one until the second amendment complaint when Thomas Tanev filed the second amendment complaint. It is at that point in time that, at best, a, a cause of action was before the trial court. Um, if you go back through cases, and we've got it all cited in our brief, but the Sabal case um, provides an excellent analysis of statutory standing and that the statute needs to be strictly applied. Um, yes, the personal representative is, um, it's, it's, it's a naming convention. Um, it's a nominal party, but it's a nominal party defined by the statute, and it's that person on whose behalf the complaint needs to be filed, and that wasn't done here. Um, it is the same issue that was before the court in Reynolds, and there was some back and forth over the actual pleading practice in in Reynolds, um, where the court had questions with regard to how the complaint was pled in Reynolds, and there also there was no identification of who the plaintiff was. The parties couldn't tell who the plaintiff was. The court here can't tell who the plaintiff was with um, Patty Lieber when she filed the complaint. 
Council, I understand your position on Cushing. Um, notwithstanding, do you feel that Cushing is distinguishable in its holding? I do, Your Honor. I will compliment Mrs. Cushing. She got it right. She was the she opened an estate. She was the administrator of the estate. She brought her complaint. If you go back, I pulled the record, Your Honor. I have a copy of the complaint here. If you go back and look, she pled her complaint in the name of the personal representative of the estate. She referenced Revised Code Chapter 2125 in pleading a cause of action for wrongful death. I, I believe, Your Honor, that case is distinguishable because your big consideration there was whether or not she, as a non-attorney, was engaging in the unlawful practice of law in representing the personal representative, which was actually herself, um, which is a distinct legal entity under the law. So I think for, uh, for those reasons, Cushing is distinguishable. Um, I also think that the Stone case out of the Ninth District is distinguishable as well because there, with all due respect, a constitutional standing standard was applied when it should have been statutory standing. Um, this court, this Ninth District, is where Ramsey originated. You, while it wasn't specifically said, this court applied a statutory standing standard in Ramsey, and the lead opinion in Ramsey out of the Ohio Supreme Court did as well. Um, as we briefed, um, as it set forth in our brief, um, the original complaint, it's our position when it was filed, the plaintiff lacked standing and capacity, and for that reason, for the, as set forth in the cases we cite, um, it was a nullity. And there's nothing to relate back to when Thomas Teneff, the personal representative of the estate, finally comes around to filing a complaint, which was well after the latest statute of limitations for any survival claim, which was two years, if you accept their ordinary negligence claims in the complaint, or wrongful death, which was a two-year statute of limitations. Um, I would say, too, it hasn't come up today yet, but there's a case that was submitted to the court, Eichenberger as supplemental authority. There's Eichenberger 1 and then there's Eichenberger 2. I think we can set aside Eichenberger 1 because that was decided by the 10th District on more procedural grounds. Eichenberger 2 got more to the merits. That was a case where the court was considering whether a survival claim, uh, whether it was standing to bring a survival claim. Um, and then it was ultimately decided on the issue of capacity. The court in Eichenberger 2 didn't really consider or reach the issue of standing. It was determined more on capacity. One thing I would say to you all here today is this, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's um, a petition for writ pending in the Ohio Supreme Court. So I would urge some caution in relying on the 10th District, unless in, in Eichenberger too, unless and until we see what the Ohio Supreme Court is going to do with it, if you feel that that is um, controlling here on the facts here, although I believe it is distinguishable because it was only considering um, survival claims and then also Capacity. It didn't get to the issues related to standing and a particular statutory standing under the wrongful death statute. Um, it's, I think it's interesting too. You know, Eichenberger comes in the 10th district after Williams v. Griffith, which was also out of the 10th district, which is supportive of our position. This court in the 9th district, we had Ramsey, which went up to the Supreme Court and was affirmed, um, and then later we had Stone in the 9th district. And Ramsey were applying, well, like I said, it wasn't specifically stated, a statutory standing standard, whereas in Stone you didn't. You applied constitutional standing um, to identify the real part, what you believe to be was the real party in interest, and for that reason um, they were found to have standing when the complaint was filed. But I think if you apply a constitutional standing that we're urging here, you're going to come to the conclusion that they did not strictly comply with the statute when the complaint was filed. Um, and for that reason, the trial court was right. Maybe they didn't use or apply or specifically state constitutional standing, but they were right in dismissing the complaint. If there are no questions at this point in time, um, I will rest on my brief. And also the motion to dismiss. Thank you. Just to address a couple points that the defense rose and raised. He says Sobel. That's the Supreme Court case that, that deals with this and say you have to strictly construe the wrongful death statute. 
for them. If you read that case, that's not what it says. Zobel actually deals with whether it's a, a two-year statute of limitations, and it says that's part of making a complaint, and yes, that, the two-year statute of limitations has to be strictly construed. This court, going back to Stone, said, referring to the wrongful death statute, says specifically, the statute is procedural and remedial in nature and should be given liberal construction and cites to Keyes, which is also the Ohio Supreme Court, which also holds that the statute should be liberally construed and not let people get out on technicalities, a mere pleading defect versus an actual substantive issue in the case. Does it turn on the fact that Ohio's body of law regarding survivorship claims not being derivative of wrong, in that interplay between a wrongful death claim and a survivorship claim? They, they've raised that issue. I, I don't think it does. I think it's one and the same. I think they, they will both fall the same way. They raised the issue of this constitutional standing versus statutory standing and try to make a distinction that you can only apply one or the other. That's not true. Um, oh shoot, I can't recall the case that, that deals with it. But they cite two cases on point for that proposition. That if it's a statutory cause of action, you have to rely on statutory standing. That's not the case. What the cases they cite say is they dismiss them because there was no constitutional, there was no injury to the person bringing the claim. And the court on appeal said, well, look, no. The statute gives them the ability to bring the claim. Just because they didn't suffer an injury, the legislature said they could still bring this claim. So yeah, statutory standing versus constitutional standing, it's not a versus. You can have one or the other and be able to bring the claim. There's nothing in Ohio case law, nothing that they cite to, that supports the proposition that if you're an injured party, you don't have standing. The only case they cite says, well, you don't get kicked out if you don't have injury, if the statute gives you standing. Huge difference. Now they say that, um, they argue Eichenberger is different. I, I, I request, we request the court read Eichenberger 1 and 2. They're not different. An individual on behalf of his wife filed a, a survival and wrongful death claim without opening the estate first. He opened the estate in, the, in Eichenberger 1. The Court of Appeal says, yeah, you can do that. You don't have to have the estate open to get into the courthouse. But you did it and you amended. The court in Eichenberger 1 doesn't, doesn't deal with the issue of relation back. That's Eichenberger 2. In that one, they look at the issue and say, yeah, just like the ninth has said, you guys have said before, if you're not changing a substantive claim, it's going to relate back. But let's go to Judge Parker's order. Judge Parker makes the specific finding that we lack standing. Even though they want to say all those other cases are wrong, going all the way back to, to Douglas in the, I think it was in the 40s or 50s, we have standing. A wrongful death beneficiary suffered an injury. She has standing. Judge Parker got that wrong. He may be correct that she didn't have capacity at the time, but capacity isn't jurisdictional. Standing is. And then he says that as to relation back, because Thomas Tanneth got appointed the nominal party on behalf of the estate, and Judge, I think you're right. I think the estate is who's here. It's not a, a person. It's the estate. It's not Mr. Tanneth. It's, it's not Mr. Pramble. The estate is what is bringing the action. Okay. But she didn't bring it in the name of the estate. She didn't allege that she was the nominal party for the estate. She just <coughs> brought it in her own name. Uh, on behalf of the wrongful death beneficiary. That's absolutely correct. And, and the reason is that, because I, her lawyer filing the, the suit for her, knew the estate hadn't been opened. If we had filed it like that, they'd be arguing that it was fraud on the court. We were misrepresenting who we were. And that argument was made in Rusk, and that went up to the Ohio Supreme Court. It, that's a red herring. Also, understanding that an appointed person by public court to represent an estate over the course of the number of years that an estate may be open. Yes, sure. Is that a reason why the statute says that um, the consent of the court making the appointment and at any time before or after the commencement, so it could happen a number of times after the commencement of the civil action? 
It could, and there have been instances where the appointed person has changed. Which is why it says that appointed person or the estate can settle with the defendant. That's correct. But it, and it says the estate. So the estate means the opening of the case, the opening of the estate, which our reading, our position would be that you don't have to have it open just to get in the courthouse. I mean, again, going back to the majority opinion in Ramsey, the idea is not to limit the statute of limitations even more. Everybody's entitled to, particularly on these negligence claims and wrongful death claims, a two-year statute of limitations. Are we now shorting it by however long it may take to get an estate open? That's not fair and that's not just. And again, defendants can't speak to any prejudice by having this amendment, which Judge Parker ruled doesn't relate back because the Ms. Lieber had no standing. The only thing they can cite to in the brief, they say, you're to decide our way. That if this were the law, a situation may arise where two siblings bring separate wrongful death actions for the estate of their mother, for the defendants to incur costs separately litigating their respective cases, and then appoint a personal representative to substitute him in the case for which the greater settlement is offered or appears more likely successful at trial. And counsel, I'm going to inform you briefly that you have a lot of 15 minute time for today. Thank you both for your presentations this morning. The court will take the matter into advisement and issue a written decision, which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted on our website and the Ohio Supreme Court website. Thank you both. Thank you, Justice.